All right, everyone. Hello, and welcome back to Science in the Age of COVID-19. Uh, today, we happily welcome Ravi Gupta, a professor of clinical microbiology at the uh, University of Cambridge, and also the Institute of Therapeutic Immunology and Infectious Disease. Uh, he is also, also holds an uh, appointment at the Africa Health Research Institute in Durban, South Africa, where uh, Howard Hughes also has a sister institute. Um, Ravi's lab has historically studied uh, primarily uh, HIV AIDS. They've um, laid a lot of the groundwork over the um, past uh, decades on pathways of drug resistance, um, stem cell treatments, protein-protein interactions, et cetera, et cetera. Um, Ravi, of course, switched the lab uh, primarily to work on SARS-CoV-2 uh, during the pandemic and has been wildly productive. Um, papers on long COVID, escape mutations, host factors, and uh, many more. And today, I uh, believe he will tell us about, certainly about neutralizing antibodies and I think also uh, some of the new variants. Okay, Ravi. Thanks very much uh, for that kind of introduction. Uh, it's a pleasure to be uh, speaking to you all. Uh, I'm not so used to doing uh, talks online, but this is going to be interesting. I think the, the questions afterwards will be important, I think, so to get some uh, sense of interaction. So I'm going to talk, tell you about a, a, a case that we have uh, uh, written up recently and uh, disseminated. Uh, and really, it just shows the power of what you can learn from one individual studied longitudinally in terms of uh, uh, understanding a new virus, really, that is, of course, causing worldwide, uh, a worldwide pandemic. So, so these are the, uh, these are the members of my team who, who did most of the work, so I should uh, uh, acknowledge them up front because uh, it's been a, a mammoth effort despite the, 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 the work being about only one patient. Um, uh, so, we, re we realized that chronic shedding um, was a thing in SARS coronavirus 2. Uh, around sort of spring last year, we were seeing cases of individuals that were being reported in the um, literature as having um, as shedding virus over extended periods. Uh, in many cases, the, the virus was still um, replication competent. In other words, you could isolate it and grow it in, uh, in tissue culture. Um, uh, so this, this, this separated it really from, from many other um, uh, respiratory diseases for which chronic infection is often exceedingly rare. This, this, uh, this uh, um, a phenomenon for coronavirus uh, uh, seems to be much more common. So, and there were cases of long-term infection in, in immune-compromised hosts being, uh, uh, being reported towards the end of 2020. Uh, and the key features have involved spike uh, mutations in the receptor binding domain as well as deletions. And we uh, started studying or, or I was looking after an individual here in, in, in Cambridge um, as an infectious diseases physician who had been positive for coronavirus for some time. He had immune deficiency, I'll tell you the story. But uh, we uh, set out to understand whether um, uh, escape or, re or resistance to treatments was going to evolve. And this it was a direct result of my background in, in the field of HIV dr drug resistance, where we've seen that seemingly unbreakable drugs can be overcome by viruses through uh, uh, very innovative means sometimes. So I was sure that we would see um, escape of, of, of coronavirus to uh, convalescent plasma and, and other treatments. Um, so, so that's why I've set out to, to do this work. And really, I mean, at the end of this, uh, we realized that what we had seen is potentially the way that variants of concern arise. So these new multimutated viruses only described in December by us and others um, really were not known when we started this work on looking at individual cases. And so the jigsaw just came to the end, came together at the end of last year. And I'll tell you why I think that's the case. So, um, just to, by way of a bit more introduction, I'll keep this brief because I'm sure everybody has um, been bored uh, or, or overexposed to the phenomenon of, uh, of, of SARS uh, spike binding to ACE2. Uh, it's a complex procedure, but no, not so different from other viruses in the way that they uh, engage receptors and then fuse 
often the, the envelope or spike proteins have two subunits and SARS-CoV-2 is, is, uh, follows this, uh, this paradigm with an S2, S1 and S2 region that gets uh, uh, cleaved and then they uh, associate in order to form an infectious uh, envelope protein or spike protein. This, in, this enables engagement with ACE2 and after engagement, you get a conformational change. And then the two membranes, the virus and the cell uh, are, are brought together and fusion occurs enabling the contents and uh, nucleic acid of the virus to enter the cell. Um, now, of course, uh, here you can see here the uh, ribbon diagram of ACE2 and, uh, and the spike receptor binding motif uh, showing some key interacting residues. Um, but not only are these, these important for the binding and uh, entry phenotype, but of course these um, are residues that are described to confer escape in vitro and, um, and increasingly in vivo to uh, neutralizing antibodies. So you have a situation here where the, the dominant response uh, uh, that we generate uh, to coronavirus spike seems to be at the receptor binding motif, which happens to also be the site at which uh, the virus needs to attach to our cells. So setting up a very interesting evolutionary uh, struggle uh, and balance um, uh, uh, as we go forward, which we'll see a bit more of later. So uh, here are just, uh, we're, we're, we're kind of jumping to the end, but, but I think that this, you know, the, I want the, you to sort of see the case through the lens of what, what it means for the world, you know, rather than just a case report of something fancy we found or something interesting that will never be of any relevance. But, the, I'll you know, the, the, the relevance of what we're going to show you is that these are three viruses, uh, viruses of concern, they call them, or, or 501YV1, V2 and V3 that have emerged in different parts of the world all of which have multiple mutations. Some of them share mutations such as 501Y, hence the nomenclature, and 501Y up here in the receptor binding domain that I showed you earlier. And then there are uh, some other similarities, for example, the 484 and 417 in the receptor binding domain in, in both the Brazilian uh, V3 or the South African origin um, uh, um, uh, uh, variant V2. So, uh, and then of course, there are a number of other changes. So some of the internal domain here, as you can see, uh, deletions in particular, um, and then a number of changes in the S2 fragment down here. And uh, uh, around 660, so 70 is where you get cleavage of S1 and S2, and you can see that some of the mutations in, in this, uh, in the UK variant, for example, uh, uh, the, the 681 mutation is not shown because it's actually not resolved, but sits around here, and that's um, uh, near the cleavage site. So you can see that the mutations that we're seeing could be an important site for the virus in the way that it interacts with cells. Uh, and this suggests that some uh, that these viruses have, of course, evolved uh, 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 in the in in hosts uh, uh, as one possibility. So, going from there um, back to our individual, well, we we had a a patient who came with follicular lymphoma uh, and had been diagnosed more than ten years back, but then had relapsed the year before, uh, had a bit of chemotherapy. Uh, uh, and importantly was on this drug called rituximab, but it's an anti-CD20 antibody that depletes B cells. In other words, uh, um, uh, removes antibody production capacity from, from the body uh, uh, and, and does lead to immune suppression. It also has effects on the T cell arm of immunity as well. So this individual was admitted, uh, went to hospital in May of last year uh, with sepsis, um, but was then diagnosed with uh, COVID-19 few days later, in the middle of May, he uh, appeared to get a bit better and then left, went home, and then came in one month later with breathlessness and cough. Uh, so there's a one month gap there. And uh, this progressed such that he needed some uh, help with the breathing uh, with continuous positive airways pressure. That's a non-invasive method of providing better uh, ventilation to a patient. He experienced pulmonary embolism, which is a well-known complication of, uh, of COVID-19. And at this time he received dexamethasone because of this deterioration in terms of his oxygenation. Um, at that time, we decided to use remdesivir. Um, uh, this is the, the only known antiviral drug with activity uh, that's, been clinic that's clinically tested and approved. Um, he had two courses of remdesivir each day, each course is 10 days separated by a five day interval. Uh, and uh, after the second course, he also received two units, two bags of convalescent plasma. Each one is from a separate donor. You can see here uh, the CT values, the cycle threshold values, uh, and this is uh, or, uh, this is looking for SARS-CoV-2 um, uh, genomes in 
uh, uh, in nasopharyngeal swabs. So this is uh, nose, sorry, nose and throat swabs. So you take a swab, put it in the nose and the throat, put it into transport media that preserves uh, viral particles, and then it's extracted and, um, and, and uh, uh, real-time PCR is done. So you can see here that the CT values really uh, uh, don't, they, there's a lot of fluctuation because of course um, they, they, it's very dependent on the sample that you take. Uh, and uh, if you go up here, it means there's less virus. If you go down, it means there's more virus. And so you can see there's no real clear trend over time and maybe an increase and decrease and an increase here, but uh, difficult to draw any conclusions in terms of treatment response here to the remdesivir and the conversant plasma. Nevertheless, after this, uh, this initial course of treatment, the, end of the, the patient uh, did improve a little bit uh, clinically, uh, ended up having problems with the heart, with atrial fibrillation. The, the kidneys weren't happy because of this period of um, illness. Uh, he was in his 70s, of course, and so uh, had a, acute renal failure. But anyway, was struggling on, uh, on the ward out of the ICU. Um, but then over time, over the next following month, then deteriorated uh, with increasing shortness of breath and problems with, the, with heart contractility, uh, such that he ended up in the ICU in the middle of March, August. Um, and we tried one final uh, attempt uh, to, to treat him with steroids um, and uh, uh, remdesivir as well as convalescent plasma. He also received this IL-6 blockade um, uh, uh, with tocilizumab. Uh, unfortunately, a couple of weeks later, he died um, uh, of a number of different causes, but, uh, but COVID-19 was contributory. Mm -hmm. So during those 100 days uh, between the first and the second um, uh, between 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 the uh, admit being admitted with the first sample and death, uh, we had twenty three uh, consecutive uh, respiratory samples. They were sequenced um, uh, at whole genome level by two methods. Um, one is Oxford nanopore. This is long read sequencing uh, that um, has is 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 very good for uh, um, uh, uh, SARS coronavirus uh, sequencing to, to obtain consensus level uh, sequence. Um, uh, we also then repeated it with uh, Illumina that is, gives shorter reads, but um, uh, gives you better variant calling at uh, lower um, frequencies. So in other words, it's better at looking at uh, zooming in on small minorities or small virus populations. This uh, phylogenetic tree is a consensus based tree. So, uh, uh, and in green, you can see our patient here with uh, um, his 23 samples uh, uh, and how they are related to each other. And here you have in different colors, these are control patients who have different, uh, who also had chronic infection for four weeks, not, not three months like this chap, but, um, but these were shedding for at least four weeks. And you can see there's relatively little sequence change in those, in those individuals. And in black here, you've got background sequences from the United Kingdom. Uh, and the reason we've put these background sequences is, is to show you that this, uh, this individual was, is very unlikely to have been reinfected with a different strain uh, um, uh, from, from somebody else. We do quite um, a lot of sequencing in the UK and therefore the, uh, um, the, the probability of detecting uh, uh, a super infection with another virus is relatively good. So this, this figure shows you um, what happened over time, uh, looking at uh, um, next generation sequencing or deep sequencing data on the individual at different time points. And on the y-axis here, you've got the proportion of, uh, of variants in the, uh, in, the, in the nose and throat sample uh, um, uh, and, and, the, and the abundance of, of, of a particular mutation. We've only included mutations in this um, diagram that were present at more than 10%, uh, at, um, uh, uh, sorry, 1% at, at more than one time interval. So you had to have a variant present more, at more than one time interval. To, 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 to be included here. Um, and so what you can see really is in the first 37 days, there's very little change, you know, very few, most variants are staying where they are. They haven't changed except for this one, particularly, particularly in the North Seven, uh, reaches around 60% uh, abundance. Um, but things start happening when the remdesivir treatment's given. Uh, you can see that a number of uh, uh, variants start increasing in frequency. They don't really even exceed 50%, so they wouldn't be even detected by a consensus level sequencing, um, and they wouldn't be reported. Um, and uh, so you can see that they arise and then decay. This one here is of particular interest. It's N501Y, which is this mutation present in uh, all the uh, 
variants of concern, the uh, V1, V2, and V3. It, in, intriguingly, you can see here that it comes up and then disappears. And we can discuss that later on, I think, as part of our discussion. Um, but the second course of remdesivir causes a more marked change in virus populations, and you get virus population with two uh, mutations in particular, um, I513 and NSP2, and then the mutation NSP12. Um, this rapidly decays uh, um, despite no change in therapy, really. Um, uh, uh, and, uh, but actually, the, what, what's happening at the same time is that the convalescent plasma um, is administered. And now this, um, this is around day 66. Uh, and concomitant with that, what you see is a shift in virus population. And here you can see emerging uh, um, uh, to, to high frequencies. Uh, mutations in spike. One is a deletion 6970 in spike, uh, and it's accompanied by D796H in, S, in the S2 um, portion. So the next slide will just show you what happens over the, the, the next um, uh, 20 or so days. Um, and you can see here that after that first course of all those two units of convalescent plasma, a lot of changes are happening really. Um, you first of all get that these this this here is the that this is two spike mutations. You see they they then start declining over the twenty days between day sixty six and eighty six. So this is coincident with the washout of um, uh, the convalescent the antibodies that are given in the convalescent plasma, um, and uh, these viruses are replaced with, a, with another population of viruses that are increasing in frequency here uh, from nothing all the way up or, or very low to all the way to. Um, uh, 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 levels of 90% and above. And there are a number of different changes here, but I'll focus here on two spike mutations that come through 200, uh, Y200H and 240I. Um, these then start to decay um, uh, 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 by themselves. And in this case, there's no change in treatment. There's no more plasma given here, uh, um, but you can see that there, there's, there's a whole um, population of viruses with these different, potentially with these different mutations declining. Um, and they're being replaced by this population here. Uh, you can see, uh, um, which is um, defined by a number of uh, uh, mutations. We see all these different lines on top of each other, um, uh, meaning that many different mutations have suddenly or have emerged um, uh, from low frequency to high frequency. Uh, and these include uh, two spike mutations. Um, uh, uh, one I've shown you here, P330S, and the other one is W64G that's not shown just because of clarity. Um, but again, uh, uh, what happens there is that those start declining um, following the third and final uh, um, uh, dose of convalescent plasma here. And uh, what happens instead is that you get this rise of the original uh, D796H and Delta 6970 population uh, with some noise um, uh, 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 following the third course. And if you cast your minds back, uh, this is the uh, same. Uh, these are the same mutations that arose after the first, first two convalescent plasma units. So uh, you have a resurgence of the same two mutations in the virus. You can see in the background here, there are a lot of uh, changes going on at lower frequencies, um, uh, suggesting that there is some kind of disturbance in the virus population. Um, uh, of course, the individual was very sick by then. There was a lot of inflammation. There was huge amounts of um, IL-6 and IL-1, uh, 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 and therefore, that, that, that could have explained part of uh, what we're seeing here. But certainly the, the key take home message is that we've got this resurgence of these two spike mutations. So why is that relevant? Well, um, let's just, before we do, uh, go there, talk about that, we just uh, look at the data in another way. Here you can see that over time, this is a highlighter plot. And what this shows you is just a simple way of looking at uh, um, uh, changes, uh, in this case, amino acid, um, uh, uh, nucleotide changes over, over, over different samples and over time. You can see here at time one, we've allocated this as a consensus sequence with no changes, of course, because it's a consensus. And then you can see what's happening over time. Again, very little at the beginning. And then you get this big, uh, this, new, this population of viruses emerging at day 93. Uh, uh, and then after day 98, you seem to go back to something more like the original population uh, uh, here you can see the deletion in black. This is the 6970 deletion. So, so you can get an idea here of, of what's happening across the genome uh, uh, in, in, in over time and how it's related to the uh, to the different treatments. 
I gave you a glimpse here of the phylogenetic tree. So this is a, a whole genome uh, tree of uh, different sequences isolated, um, and you can you can see the sequences are labeled by the time that they were taken. Uh, again, in the early days, very little sequence change, as we've shown. Um, but as time goes on, this is the day of uh, this is around the time of the first uh, convalescent plasma and uh, um, uh, a dose. You can see that then there's this uh, population emerging here, and that's defined by the 200 to um, uh, also, you get the, you've got the D69, uh, D69, uh, D796H plus Delta 6970 group that I showed you earlier um, uh, emerging and actually uh, being present not only right at the end towards day 100, but the, of, of course we saw it at day 82, as I showed you earlier. Uh, and then this population that seemed to be very different uh, emerging at day 93 and um, persisting to 95, but then disappearing. Uh, to be replaced by this D, uh, Delta 69 population, you can see it's very long branch length, and that that was that's really intriguing because this uh, this indicates that the virus these viruses were undetected for the first three months, and then for some reason emerged in this individual, suggesting that they may have some kind of uh, selection advantage, or it may even be a stochastic event. Um, but this is the, the, we did some analysis to understand that big branch, um, and what this this graph shows you is that is, is we're, we're plotting here time or sample time, and here we're plotting uh, plotting this against the uh, genetic distance, and you can see that in those in that branch uh, leading to the p three thirty here in these are, these are marked in red, and you can see they have much higher uh, pairwise sequence distances. In other words, they are uh, distinct from the underlying um, uh, virus population. Uh, 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 at the earlier and later time points. Uh, this uh, again shows you similar, dis similar data in, uh, just differently. This is um, pairwise distances on the, on the x-axis and uh, the frequency of um, pairwise sequences uh, fitting these different bins is shown. So you can see there's a, there's, a popular, there's, a, there's, a, there's a double peak. The second population is consisting of the P330 lineage viruses that, uh, that have much greater pairwise sequence distances. Um, and if you take those um, P330 viruses away from the rest, you get a distribution that is um, uh, um, uh, back to normal. So that's evidence that there is a subpopulation um, uh, in the patient that emerges um, for due to due to a reason that we don't understand. And, and, and this really is a glimpse without, you see, the, the importance of this is the fact that we can't sample different parts of the respiratory tract so easily. So all of these samples samples are coming out of the nose and throat. Um, and so it's only by observing somebody over time that you can see these different viral populations emerging uh, uh, to that single site. If we were able to sample different parts of the lung, for example, we might get a get a glimpse, a greater glimpse of some of these, um, these variants. Here's just a, a simplified diagram of the spike region only. Again, this is um, mutation prevalence over time, and here you've got the treatments. It's just again to reiterate to you that here's the D D796H and Delta 6970 population disappears. Two other vir virus populations emerge in the interim, and then after the third course of convalescent plasma, you get the resurgence of, of the uh, this double mutant. So where are those mutations in the in the spike protein? So this is a, um, a, some, a, some, some modeling we've done based on uh, cryo and stru some, uh, structures. And you can see here the, uh, the, D the Delta 6970, it's out exposed um, uh, in a disordered region that's not actually uh, resolved in most, in most um, uh, um, uh, structures, uh, but uh, it's modeled to, um, to shrink if you remove these two amino acids. So it's kind of protruding here. And if you, if you remove them, it, the, there's a shrinkage inwards. Um, so this suggests that, they, that it might be part of an epitope uh, or have other, some other function. If we look at D796H, it's down here in S2. Again, it's exposed uh, 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 and therefore uh, could be implicated in antibody binding. So we... we uh, next proceeded to try and understand what those mutations were doing. So we used um, a virus pseudotyping assay, which uh, involves, uh, is, this is a method that we use in order to test what those spike mutations are actually doing uh, without having to use live virus uh, and engineer those mutations in, which is a laborious process because of the size of this virus. So what we do is we essentially take HIV virions and we uh, express, we co-express spike proteins with different mutations. So you get essentially a lentiviral particle that has um, spike protein on its outer surface. 
And uh, we do this by, by transfecting different plasmids in to producer cells. The producer cells produce a pseudovirus, and we add this pseudovirus to target cells. And then we can test the effect of different antibodies or serum uh, on, the, on the infectivity of those spike uh, pseudotyped viruses on um, target cells. Uh, and we use a, a reporter uh, uh, that, that, uh, uh, that, uh, that expresses um, uh, uh, signals such as, such as luciferase, um, or you can use GFP, um, but uh, luciferase enables us to do higher throughput uh, measurements and allows us to do large numbers of serial dilutions. So um, uh, uh, the, the analysis down here at the bottom essentially shows you uh, 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 that we do titration of the serum, for example, which contain, containing antibodies, and we look at the signals uh, of luciferase and plot them against each other. You should get a nice S-shaped shaped curve. It's called a dose-response curve. And if I um, uh, uh, show you, first of all, before we go to the dose-response curves for the sera, um, uh, uh, to look at the, the neutralization capability of, of, of this convalescent serum given to the patient, it's first important to check the, uh, the infectivity of the viruses that you're producing. First of all, have you made an infectious pseudoparticle or has something gone wrong? Uh, so to do this, what we, um, uh, we did is we uh, generated this, the, the viral particles. We normalized their input by measuring the amount of reverse trans transcriptase activity in the supernatants from producer cells. We then um, infected target cells um, uh, 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 with, with that virus, but we, uh, we, we, we blotted um, uh, the virus supernatants that were normalized for, and we blotted them for uh, um, a spike using an S2 antibody, monoclonal antibody, and we blotted for HIV P24 for the particle. So this, the P24 shows you've got relatively equal amounts of, of virus in the supernatants, um, and the spike proteins are all expressed to reasonable um, uh, 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 levels. You may note an increase in the delta 6970 expression, and that's um, uh, the subject of some of our ongoing work. So uh, if you look at the infectivity of those supernatants now on uh, target cells, you can see that the, D the D796H uh, mutant did incur a significant replication or single round infectivity defect um, that was rescued here in the double mutant towards back towards wild type levels. And the, D6, the delta 6970 alone um, conferred uh, something like a twofold increase over wild type. So um, the hypothesis here was that potentially the D796H was some kind of antibody escape mutation that the virus had evolved, um, uh, uh, but that because of the fitness defect, it needed to restore infectivity. And that's why the, the, the 6970 deletion uh, uh, was acquired and selected. So that was the, the hypothesis we, we were hoping to test. So what we did then is we took each of the convalescent plasma units that was administered to the individual, and we did uh, uh, generated dose response curves using the assay I described to you earlier. And you can see here the, 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 the curves. This is a log scale, uh, it's an inverse dilution uh, log scale. So if you shift to the right, you are uh, uh, decreasing neutralization, in other words, becoming more resistant. And you can see here that the 79H, D796 is shifted to the right. Um, suggesting that this mutant, uh, as, uh, in combination also with the 6970, is more is less sensitive to the antibodies. So this patient was a little bit resistant to the convalescent plasma one. Uh, uh, similarly, there's a similar situation for the, conv uh, the convalescent plasma two, uh, and and also three. So each of these um, uh, these units of convalescent plasma from a different donor didn't perform or neutralize. Uh, the D796 containing virus as well as it did a wild type virus. And the wild type here is a, a virus based on the Wuhan sequence that has the D614G mutation that now is uh, pretty much uh, um, present in every virus, every SARS coronavirus um, uh, globally. If you quantify those um, shifts by fold change relative to wild type, you can see that uh, in, in nearly all the cases, the D796 gauge uh, gives you an increase in fold change, in other words, it reduces susceptibility uh, 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 across the different convalescent plasma units. And importantly, that the, descent, uh, the, the, the deletion on its own does not seem to cause an increase in susceptibility in any of the um, experiments. In fact, can, uh, uh, in fact, the, 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 the deletion here um, uh, uh, makes the spike protein a little bit more uh, sensitive to antibodies in some of the, case, some of the cases. We also then went on to test the, um, 
the serum from the patient. So of course, after the infusion, we were able to sample uh, blood from the, the patient. Uh, 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 this is day 64. This is just before the first unit of convalescent plasma. And day 66 is, a, is, a, is, a, is the day after, or yeah, the day after the convalescent plasma was administered. So the blood should have uh, neutralizing antibodies because of the administration of CP. And indeed, you can see that uh, uh, there uh, um, that, that, that you're getting a similar picture as I showed you before that the the, the D796H containing viruses are less sensitive uh, to um, uh, to the to 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 the, uh, the, the the plasma from the, the plasma from the patient both at day 64 and day 66. Um, moving on to uh, neutralizing antibodies. Uh, uh, that uh, look to, to examine this from a different point of view. I've shown you data from the sera from convalescent donors. Each of those convalescent plasma units was donated by somebody who'd recovered from coronavirus and therefore had was polyclonal, had a mixture of antibodies at different targeting different parts of the spike protein and other parts of the virus. Uh, we collaborated with colleagues uh, in the Netherlands and obtained a number of um, monoclonal antibodies mainly directed at the RBD, as you can see here, there are different types, uh, one, uh, one, three, uh, uh, um, six, and seven, and nine. So these are classed according to where they bind uh, uh, relative to the receptor binding domain. And then we had one non-RBD binding antibody. So the point of this was to just um, check whether we were getting shifts in IC50s or uh, sensitivity uh, using antibodies um, uh, against our different mutants. And so because neither mutant is in the RBD, you would expect that um, these uh, monoclonals shouldn't really impact the mutants any differently. And um, indeed, you, we didn't see much evidence for shifts of our mutant viruses. Uh, in, uh, uh, in particular, you're looking at the, 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 the black curves. Uh, and, in, and in general, you, uh, we found very little difference. We certainly didn't find D796H was less sensitive to, to any of these, uh, except the non-RBD binder. So this is an intriguing um, antibody. We don't quite know where this antibody uh, is binding, but it does appear that D796H containing viruses are less sensitive to this, um, to this monoclonal. So, so um, uh, suggesting that, uh, uh, that wherever this antibody is binding is, is relevant for D796H. So we were intrigued by the deletion because we'd uh, noted uh, that the deletion at 6970 has been uh, emerging in different strains of uh, uh, transmitting viruses around the world. So you can see here in red are uh, viruses uh, um, from global um, uh, global database that have the, the uh, Delta 6970 um, mutation uh, deletion without uh, the N501Y. Um, so you can see there are a number of them emerging independently here. They're, they do have common ancestors, but they seem to be um, uh, transmitting independently. Um, and here, down here at the bottom, we have uh, essentially the B117. And the re we stumbled across the B117 back in the end of November because what we were looking for lineages with Delta 6970. And we found this lineage here, but it seemed to have a very long branch length, number one. And number two, when we looked at the spike sequences, there were um, uh, seven other mutations in the spike protein. So this was, you know, obviously very surprising. And when we looked further, this was uh, uh, this was a virus that had not been described before. And um, uh, later in December, we and others reported uh, the emergence of B117. So that's how we went from one patient to you know, identifying the, uh, the the fact that there was a new lineage um, circulating in the UK. Uh, of course, the public health agencies were also looking at the expanding outbreak and uh, its increased transmissibility and also came to the same conclusion that there was a new virus. Um, just thought I'd put our case in context of other cases of long-term shedding. You can see here, this is our case patient in green. Uh, we uh, Here I'm showing you that actually we isolated viruses from um, the, the patient's cell phone and, and the call bell in the room. Uh, that, that did cluster with the rest of the viruses isolated. Um, we have a number of other cases here, one reported in the New England Journal by my colleague Jonathan Lee, 
uh, Choi et al. here, you can see this patient also had significant amounts of diversification. diversification. Uh, these were largely deletions, but towards the end, he did develop um, uh, RBD mutations as well. Uh, and another patient here from Avanzato et al. Uh, down here, much less diversification, but importantly, this is a patient who was asymptomatic. So this individual was shedding for around three months uh, without illness, but they did have a background here of um, uh, chronic lymphocytic leukemia. Uh, uh, which was probably the underlying condition that predisposed to chronic infection and inability to clear the virus. <clears throat> so um, I think the point of this slide really is to, is, to, is to highlight that, yes, you can get large amounts of diversity, but I think that um, the, the, the specific mutations that are, that, uh, that are emerging are probably more important than the overall diversification that could be driven by a number of different processes. So to, um, uh, to sort of start off the discussion, I think we've, we, we think we showed the first real-time documentation of a virus that is actively escaping from neutralizing antibodies. Um, we say this because we have genetic evidence, uh, which is the rise and fall of a virus population containing an S2 mutation, D796H, as well as an NTD, N-terminal domain mutation, uh, uh, or del double deletion, uh, 6970. That was driven by uh, administration of convalescent plasma. And we saw a waxing and waning of that virus population that coincided very nicely with the presence of neutralizing antibodies in the blood. Um, we also then went on to generate phenotypic evidence of reduced in vitro susceptibility. And it wasn't, and what was surprising is that the reduced susceptibility of that virus that we made was evident across at least three units of convalescent plasma. Uh, from different donors. So whatever the 796H mutation is doing, it seems to be uh, a conserved target of the neutralizing antibodies. And of course, most of the antibodies that have been described have been targeting the uh, receptor binding domain, but it does highlight the fact that we should be looking beyond the RBD for uh, neutralizing antibody activity. Uh, when we tested a suite of monoclonals against the RBD, as expected, we found they weren't impacted by mutations because they are mutations are outside the receptor binding domain. So that gave us some uh, confidence that our results uh, were indeed um, accurate. The broad resistance to multiple serum may uh, demonstrate a common pathway of resistance, which of course is important because um, the virus is trying to find common ways of escaping antibodies, as we have observed with the uh, uh, N501Y in combination with 484. This confers quite significant resistance to uh, uh, sera from multiple individuals and also to vaccine-induced sera. Moving on to the, the Delta 6970 deletion, we see that uh, that is uh, rising in multiple lineages, usually after acquisition of uh, receptor binding domain mutations. For example, the T453, uh, uh, sorry, that's uh, Y453F, Y4, which is the mink-related uh, mutation. Uh, you may all know that uh, in uh, uh, um, Denmark in particular, they have seen uh, transmissions between uh, farmed mink and humans and bi-directional transmission uh, associated with this receptor binding domain change. We've also seen um, N439K lineages uh, in the UK spreading into Europe now uh, that also have acquired the deletion uh, uh, in addition to the mink viruses inquiring the deletion. And of course, we now have seen an N501Y lineage that has acquired the Delta 6970, and that is the B117, now present in 91 countries, including the United States. Um, and I, I think the take home here really is that it's difficult to imagine a virus with 23 mutations emerging in a population that's heavily sampled and heavily sequenced uh, without that having happened in a single patient. And we do have uh, some intermediate sequences. One in particular, uh, we've, uh, we've identified a, a, a sequence in the UK database that has the Delta 6970, the N501Y, and it has the D111, so D1188H mutation, which is one of the mutations found in the UK variant. So that's an intermediate virus that may have been shed by the individual as they were accumulating mutations, or that could be 
um, there could have been two transmissions and a few mutations happened in one person and then the other mutations happened in somebody else. That's also possible. But I think that the, the, the evidence for me certainly is pointing in the, in the direction that these, um, these variants are emerging in relatively few individuals rather than the stepwise accumulation of a single mutation per host. But that needs, uh, remains to be tested uh, empirically. Uh, if you'd like to read more about this, uh, the, the paper came out, I think, uh, 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 just over two weeks ago. Uh, and we are following up the work on Delta 6970, and perhaps I can, I'll get a chance to present that to you uh, in the future. Um, and I'd like to end by acknowledging everyone on this slide, as well as my lab, uh, and to open the talk to questions. Thank you, Ravi. That was a great talk. Um, we heard about the real-time emergence of these variants, which I must say are pretty concerning at this moment. So let's get into the discussion right away. Um, so from what I understand, viruses mutate all the time, right? And most of these mutations pretty much do nothing. A collection of mutations end up as variants. Variants go on to become variants of interest, and some of them end up as variants of concern, right? So what are the different pathways by which mutations end up as variants of concern. I mean, we've clearly seen one mechanism here where a prolonged infection in an immune compromised state sets a favorable stage for virus evolution. So what are the other mechanism? And adding to that is what's more dangerous is chronic infection or the immune compromised state? Uh, well, that's interesting. That's a good question. I think that, um, uh, well, one predisposes to the other. So most people will clear the infection within days and then some people have chronic infection and they appear to have normal immune systems but i guess there's a spectrum and some people have a subclinical immune deficiency or immune, immune dysfunction and then you have the immune compromised where where you see these case reports that i've been that i highlighted are all individuals with some degree of immune compromise who have been shedding so for now the evidence is pointing to mutations evolving in those with immune compromise Mm. Um, rather than viruses jumping between people and accumulating single mutations. And if you imagine most of the time uh, in transmission, you transmit uh, uh, within a couple of days maybe of being infected because the virus replication rate is so high. By the time you have symptoms, you have very high viral loads. You've probably infected people already. Um, and so the virus is jumping between hosts without the need to overcome any immunity, except for innate immunity potentially. Mm. So that's interesting, since you mentioned immune compromised state as being, a, a, you know, something which predisposes uh, to the evolution. So we've seen uh, emergence of variants in South Africa, and South Africa also has the highest prevalence of another virus disease, HIV, right? Mm -hmm. um, and we know HIV infection also leads to immune dysregulation. So I'm just trying to see, is there a possible correlation that uh, you know, the prevalence mm. of HIV would have uh, led to some general immune compromised state that have, might have given this virus a selection pressure to evade, um, you know, so yeah. Mm. Immune, immune. Yep. I mean, that was one of the early kind of hypotheses or theories put forward that, you know, it may have arisen in the context of HIV and, and certainly that is a strong possibility. Hard to know. There are obviously many immune compromised people and up for other reasons in South Africa. Uh, South Africa also had a good genomic surveillance system set up uh, uh, again um, out of out of the uh, HHMI part HHMI funded building in in Durban, um, mm -hmm. and so they were kind of ready to detect it when it happened. Uh, so it, it's very intriguing. I really would like to know whether this was HIV associated. <clears throat> I guess if it was, if it were HIV associated, we might see further variants emerging in high. HIV prevalence countries, that mm -hmm. remains to be seen. Hey, Ravi, amazing talk. Um, I, I've got a vaguely philosophical question here. So I'm, I'm struck by the pattern of emergence of mutation and then decay. I mean, mm. you know, so that was, you know, th that was the default. Mm -hmm. um, but so many of these mutations do seem to provide clear selective advantage, like the 6970 uh, deletion. Um, mm -hmm. why, why do you think that 
that things don't tend to fixate until it looks like his final two weeks. Um, you know, why, why do you think the deletion arose and then decayed? Yeah, that's, a, that's an important question. Um, I think it tells you that the virus is optimized for doing its thing in general. And when there are antibodies around, you disturb it. And it may evolve escape mutations, but it's still probably less fit than the wild type. But then you have to ask the question, well, why did the wild type not come back? Why did this 240 yeah. mutation come up? Then why did this come up? And I think there are a number of contributing factors. One is the illness in the individual. This virus had gener it set up a chronic COVID infection with very high inflammation you know, C-reactive proteins in the 200s, 300s, you know, very high swinging temperatures. And that will have effects that we have we cannot model. Um, and potentially that also places selection pressure on the virus for certain viruses to persist and, and flourish in that environment. So um, it, 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 it is hard to understand how the, you know, why the, the 16970 did, went away because we know that the 16970 is now transmitting in humans. Um, but yeah. again, transmitting between well, you know, physiologically well people is a very different thing to trying to replicate in a person who has a temperature of 40 and, um, mm. uh, you know, a huge inflammatory response, uh, even though they don't have a great immune system, there's still a, a lot going on, a lot of um, uh, disturbance uh, metabolically and physiologically going on. So I, it would be great to know if this would happen in a, a well person or not. Yeah. In a different this, circumstance. It's just so counterintuitive. So I, I'm, I'm a protein engineer by training and every protein we optimize, I mean, no protein sits remotely near its, you know, its sequence, uh, its fitness maximum. Um, right. Just hard, hard to believe that it would be, you know, perfectly tuned yeah well you see the other thing i didn't mention actually is i did mention in the talk is, is this thing about anatomical distribution and populations so as i was mentioning i was saying we just sampled everything through the nose and throat whereas this yeah. this disease was affecting the heart the lungs you know the spleen and there was going to be a balance of there's going to be a there's a there's a there's a war going on inside you know in terms of which variants are going to win out and you're only getting a very brief glimpse or snapshot of that and that's what i think was most valuable about this because i think what this is telling you is that is a reflection of different anatomically distributed virus populations that do mix at some level it, for some reasons and this is the result yeah. of that yeah I, I think it's so cool that you guys did the long read sequencing because i mean you need that to get at the viral ensemble which well, in, yeah, we didn't talk about that, but we did both because I wasn't sure whether the long read would do the trick. And I mean, we did compare them and I because I thought Illumina would be because I thought we would be dealing with very low population abundance, like, you know, 1%, 2%, 3%. And so we compared in this figure, um, long and short reads, you know, Nanopore versus Illumina. Illumina. You can see that the proportion with certain mutations, we've taken four main mutations. And in general, they these things kind of correlate, you know, the orange is high in both cases, you know what I mean? But here, for example, there's a discrepancy for the deletion. Um, it appears that the, the deletion was called differently by the two methods. So uh, unclear as to which was correct. Um, we did do single genome amplification after the reviewers asked for it. And I'm glad they did because mm. we, we got our SGA, which is basically taking doing a separate PCR, diluting out your template and then looking at single genomes amplified showed us that there were that this was broadly reflective of what was going on mm -hmm. um yeah that's awesome so next we've got a, an audience question from brian brian please unmute yourself uh you should thanks thanks so much what a great talk uh, i'm just wondering what the implications are for a uh, vaccination strategies uh in terms of immunocompromised uh, patients getting a uh, priority what would have happened if your patient had been vaccinated um, with either one or two shots? Right. Um, vaccination. I mean, well, if you'd had vaccine before being infected, I mean, the you may have seen something 
not dissimilar, which is that there was sort of suboptimal levels of antibody, the virus comes in, starts replicating, but you'd probably see sequence change much earlier than the than the 37 days we saw here. But yeah, I, I mean, I take your point. I think that um, vaccination and immune compromised individuals may lead to selection of mutations. And, and I think that's something I haven't really thought about too much, mainly because it's worrying. <laughs> Uh, but, 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 but yeah, vaccinating sub subtherapeutic vaccination and then infection might be a problem. So that's why we need to drive down prevalence as well as, you know, um, in the general population. And maybe we should kind counterintuitively, uh, you know, vaccinate the immune suppress the last because first mm -hmm. of all, they may not make good responses. And secondly, they may end up with being infected and then ending up with, you know, escape mutants. Mm. Um, wow. These are difficult questions, you know, public health versus individual um, treatment, for example, with the convalescent plasma, you know, this, this paper triggered a lot of controversy about what, whether we should use convalescent plasma and the US has now said they won't use it, but I think that there were other reasons, not just, I don't think it was just this, but, but it did create some concern and maybe rightly so, because, you know, one case of it led to a global, you know, emergence of, of the B117, it only takes one, you know, so is it worth stopping one infection? Possibly yeah. yes, given, given what we've seen. Thank you. Thanks, Brian. So Ravi, adding to that, would you have predicted a similar outcome had the convalescent plasma been administered to a non-immune compromised individual? Mm. Yeah, I don't think this would have happened because um, with a competent immune system, there are already high levels of antibodies there all you're doing is piling in some more. So, um, you know, there are these people who get very sick and shed for a long time. Uh, you know, people and a lot of these people end up getting very sick and on ventilators. They have, often have high levels of virus in the lung. Um, CP hasn't been shown to be effective in those, and I don't think monoclonals have either. So mm -hmm. clearly the, the pathophysiology is different in in severe disease it's more maybe more something about the immune system being dysregulated rather than just switching off virus replication interesting so circling back to the previous discussion that you were having on samples from upper respiratory tract versus lower respiratory tract i mean to what extent do you predict a compartmentalized difference of you know, the viral genomes? I mean, do you think the virus would be really different? Had you been sampling from upper respiratory tract versus lower yeah. respiratory tract? Yeah, I think there will be. There will be, well, in a in a normal person, probably not, because it's very quick, as I said, um, uh, and you clear the virus by innate immunity very quickly, even before your antibodies have even started doing anything. Um, but uh, in chronic infection, yes, I think there could be a difference because, of course, you have different levels of ACE2 uh, in different parts of the respiratory tract. You have different levels of antibody penetration, different Im innate immune levels, you know. So you will, over the course of three months, develop our subpopulations in your body, and there's just no doubt. Um, and this, this study is a, is a demonstration of that. These viruses, very, very, you know, that last, that one on the really long branch that I spent a lot of time on, the reason I did that is because that virus was hang. it didn't just, it wasn't a, a super infection from someone else. It was there all along mm -hmm. uh, and it arose or it arose from the main population, but it was not, it didn't become evident until hundred days in when it was given some opportunity. And it, in my view, it was probably replicating in like a kind of niche area of the body mm -hmm. um, in wow. some particular cell type or in a particular compartment and somehow it got an advantage. Yeah. Yeah. Um, hey, Ravi, we just wanted to check your time. So it's six minutes. Yeah, I think probably need to, to probably wrap up with what, maybe one more question. Okay. There are um, fantastic. Um, um, what was the nature of the mutations that you saw in response to remdesivir treatment? I mean, I, I, I would assume that they would arise in RDRP, but I thought your plot was showing that they were spike mutations. Well, we did see an RDRP mutation actually in during remdesivir. Um, it was 157, I think V157L. We because we don't have assays for testing um, RDRP in vitro, we have not pursued it. 
And to be honest, the, the remdesivir didn't do anything anyway. So, I mean, <laughs> sure, it doesn't work. So, I mean, but then you could say the same about neutralizing antibodies. But I think the, po the, the point there is that the emergent mutations are a problem mm -hmm. for vaccines and, you know, such like. Yeah. Wow. Well, Ravi, thanks for the amazing talk and um, being so generous with your time. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye Take then. Care. Thanks for the invitation. All right. Thanks again. Bye. Bye. Yep. Well, we have um, Michael Mina. Yeah, yes. Michael Mina next week. Um, so see you everyone then. All right. Stay safe.